I'm going to start off with just making some connections between these past couple years and um, the 60s. Because for me, and I suspect um, many of you in the Council of Elders that um, um, this is, has been sort of a, a tumultuous reenactment and reliving of what happened in the 60s. Um, in, and, and there are several ways that I like to look at this. There have been so many revelations made this year about um, inequities and, and, um, and the response and the responsibility that people have taken on. But I'd just like to go through a few of those because they, they also um, point to, I think, some of what we have to do around housing issue and in cities and universities and so on. Um, first, let me say that in the 60s, among other things, I was intimately involved in the um, struggle against urban renewal in the Lincoln Park neighborhood. Um, I, it was a movement in which literally thousands of people were involved. And I was the principal organizer, others organizations grew and took over uh, activity and so forth. But initially and throughout, I was, I continued to be a primary organizer. So I want to talk more extensively about that. But just um, in the 60s, in addition to the civil rights movement and all of the issues of social and human justice that were laid bare, uh, that was, we were helped along in that process by the other horrible situation of the war in Vietnam. And in the, in the, the most recent events of 2021, COVID laid bare the ugly realities that had come, have come, and it still exists from systemic racism. The response then, and the response now have been very similar with a few little changes and um, large numbers of population, citizens, especially youth and church members participating in the 60s, along with uh, socialists on civil rights, anti-war and other movements. The loudest and the clearest was the same as this year, youth. It was the civil rights and Anti-war movements then were led by young people. Um, uh, all those in, in uh, SCLC were young that when they began SNCC, they were young, um, certainly in the anti-war movements. So I continued to hold up and lift up our youth because ca carrying this the current movement forward, it's so important to support our youth. Uh, the difference, I think, now between, between now and then is that there were also, in the 50 years intervening, uh, many justice workers who have continued to fight and provide um, knowledge, inspiration, um, wisdom to the young people. The Justice Project coming out of UIC is an important example of that. The, the reaction to the 60s, good things came out of that and many not so good. The Kerner Report, which I think we all need to go back to, um, was the result of the civil rights movement. And of course, the pieces of legislation, voting rights, civil rights. And I another that sometimes goes under the radar. This is the first time in our, in our country that we have had such a large educated, college educated population, which I think is giving wisdom and in inspiration to the current movement and will carry us forward. Um, but the reaction also was a deep entrenchment in the historic issues that arose out of slavery and continue to this day. 
uh, an entrenchment from corporations, from large sections of the government, uh, every aspect of society has been uh, touched by this as we see in what's being told today. But nevertheless, um, the responsibilities continue for, to continue our justice work. And I say that because what happened in the 60s around housing is, and the extensiveness of that is not widely known. There has been a lot said recently about redlining, which we know about, about um, contract buying and many other forms in which the wealth of the African-American community especially has been degraded rather than increased. Uh, but the massive movement and the effects of that that took place in the 60s around urban renewal is not widely known. So that's really what I'm going to talk about right now. Um, just in, in summary, the, the um, urban renewal movement was in, in cities, but especially in Chicago where it began, was operating alongside of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and um, was both inspired by as well as participated by uh, those in the other movements. The movement in Chicago included literally thousands of ordinary Chicago citizens who mostly poor and working class. I don't think, know if we've ever se seen so many poor and working class people involved at one time in a struggle for their rights. And it was actually, actually became a very desperate struggle at times of, by people who were in jeopardy of being moved from their homes for the expansion of institutions and higher income residences. In the 60s and 70s, the three areas of the city that were principally affected were Hyde Park and Woodlawn first, with the University of Chicago participating uh, with the city of Chicago for that expansion. Second was Lincoln Park and near north, um, and those, the organizations that had joined with the city um, to create this movement and, and make urban renewal reality were DePaul University, Children's Memorial Hospital, and McCormick Theological Seminary, along with a neighborhood organization, Lincoln Park Conservation Association, and private um, real estate contractors, Draper and Kramer and Rubloff being the largest and the most aggressive, but there were also many other smaller um, real estate companies that were involved. And on the near west side, the third area, um, that was the area designated by the city for the building of UIC. And that that area had been principally the home to a first generation Italian community and the, the um, battle against UIC's aggress the uh, University of Illinois aggressiveness was um, uh, Florence Scala who led the movement for almost 20 years. It was a long um, um, battle. In other places, the leadership was decimated by the city, murdered, um, and other things happened. We can talk more about that. But um, during, the, during this period of the late 60s and mid 70s, literally se several hundred thousand people, several hundred thousand people were moved from their homes, homes um, often very aggressively by the city of Chicago and their, their partners in community. 
it was done through uh, designation of certain areas for remove for um, uh, gentrification, or the term used was renewal. We called it removal. In Lincoln Park, the um, first area designated was near North, the area just south of North Avenue. And it continued from the lake over to just west of Halstead Street. And it went from um, south to north of Diversity. It went just to the south end of um, Lakeview. In that area, the dominant population was Puerto Rican. And so it meant literally the removal of the Puerto Rican population from the community. So um, naturally, one of the groups that uh, joined, um, initially they had no sense of what was going on, but uh, were invited to a city meeting in which this plan was laid out and became quite militant at that meeting. And afterwards, um, followed by a lot of political education. That was the Young Lords organization. Um, but there were many others that joined in as well, mothers and others. Uh, the whole movement in the Lincoln Park neighborhood, uh, initially against um, the urban renewal movement was um, formed and fought by churches. 26 churches joined together in what was called the Northside Cooperative Ministry. It was all the mainline denomination, um, except for the Catholic Church, but one of the Catholic churches, St. Teresa's, actively participated in the movement as well. The um, next area for uh, renewal, removal, was the area just um, west of Halstead that went from Halstead over to um, just west of Sheffield. It included the area occupied by DePaul University and, and Children's Memorial Hospital. I mean, excuse me, not Children's, um, but McCormick Theological Seminary. Um, at Many efforts were used by the coalition. It was called the Poor People's Coalition. Later it was became the Rainbow Covenant uh, as, as the organizations in the community joined with Fred Hampton and the first Rainbow Covenant in uh, the city. But initially it was the, it, it was um, people who were taking on um, McCormick Theological Seminary and DePaul University requesting that they join, that they not participate with the city of Chicago and join with the community for a community in which poor, low income, moderate income, wealthy could live in community together. McCormick outright refused. And therefore there was a point at which McCormick Theological Seminary had just built a new building, stone administration building, and the community occupied and held it for a week while negotiations took place at the National Presbyterian Conference that was taking place down in Texas. Uh, we, we were able to negotiate certain um, um, uh, to, to gain um, certain, I can't hear the word is not coming to me, get certain benefits from that negotiation. Uh, one of them being uh, $601,000 to develop a small, um, low, moderate housing complex for Larrabee Street in the community. DePaul refused to come to any of the negotiations, never came to the table with the community, never 
came to the table. But there was a large contingent of DePaul University students who were supporting the community coalition, uh, as well as seminary students from McCormick. Uh, so I'm hoping that in my recommendations going forward, we can begin to elicit that kind of response from DePaul University alumni and alumni. The, the end of this story is that there were several thousand, several hundred thousand people and homes, um, as well as businesses. There were a lot of small businesses, many historic businesses in the community, which were forced to move as well. Uh, the majority were owned by ethnic European um, folks who had been there for many years. Some moved two, three times. And finally their businesses were forced to close because they lost their clientele. The um, result of all of this is that over the um, 50, near 50 years that have transpired, universities which have been partners in nearly every urban renewal or gentrification situation in the country, but especially in Chicago, universities have been primary partners for expansion and growth of the university, not facilities immediately directed toward education, although that has been the case as well, but also for the expansion of housing. The area now occupied by the University of Chicago is about a two square mile area. The same for UIC and a smaller area um, in, the, in the Lincoln Park community by DePaul University who then took over McCormick's property as well. But the, the residuals in all the surrounding areas go to support those institutions uh, with higher income housing and the majority of the poor working class people who have been forced out now well over a million have been removed uh, in the city of Chicago has led to resegregation of black and brown communities in other sections of the city, but as well contribution to an unthinkable uh, unthinkably large number of homeless population, which will continue to grow and we know has grown significantly as a result of COVID and what's happened between landlords and tenants. How could all this happen? It happened legally in the late 1940s, Mayor Daley, joined together with Truman to write the first urban renewal legislation. There were changes throughout the 50s, but in the 1950s, um, Daly aggressively moved to, as he called, rebuild uh, the tax base in the city, which had been um, lessened after World War II when many residents from Chicago moved to the suburbs. It's my belief, and I'm sure everyone's here, that there are more equitable and human ways to uh, build a tax base and to, and to create a space where all can live comfortably, but also humanely, and where everyone can have a stable housing living situation. As we move forward, I am hoping that the council can, um, well, I'm focusing on DePaul because that's where we're at. We're a council of elders of uh, the Egan Urban Center. Jack Egan was always a militant fighter for justice. He and my husband were like brothers. And um, till the very end, they worked on creating situations of justice where no one else would enter in. 
So the Egan Urban Center really is the appropriate place to begin to pressure um, whatever word we want to use, uh, the university to be to acknowledge first their role in creating a um, racist situation, based, essentially, whether we're talking about it by class or uh, race or ethnics, um, and to reverse that that it really is part of a, should be part of a moral agenda for any Christian, Catholic, uh, religious institution that housing be a basic standard that that institution works to support a, a quality housing for all. And It almost is a crisis situation right now coming out of COVID that um, I believe that uh, DePaul should acknowledge its failures in the past and, and move forward with the partnership of the University of Chicago. McCormick, McCormick has already agreed they want in. Um, and there are people at uh, UIC, faculty primarily, who are interested in a citywide housing coalition to begin to reverse or at least provide adequate housing for the citizens of the city. Whether that happens through renovation of old um, uh, factory buildings, commercial buildings uh, for housing, um, new construction, um, I have behind me probably uh, 300 um, containers that can be repurposed into housing for individuals and small families. Um, th there are so many opportunities that we have to, you know, expand our horizons for um, housing for people in the city. And, you know, I'm asking the council to, I, I, I keep getting exhausted in the struggles, the things I continue to be involved in. I feel like I still am involved in so many to um, join me in making, um, in pushing the university, whether I keep hearing on WBEZ at least once a day that DePaul is proud to um, have produced 90,000 university students that are making the wor world better every, in every corner of the world. And I think, oh my God, those 90,000 could would certainly support the university in providing housing for those who have been displaced through the actions and the amassing of wealth that each of these universities has accomplished for themselves. I'm going to end there and I hope that there are there are many comments. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'm, I'm very curious, personally, um, just for the record, is did you do did you research everything that was shared today or is this some of the things that you've lived through yourself no i actually i um was hoping to have time to do research i didn't these are lived experiences Pat, it'd be good i mean for those who don't know you to just give a little bit of a bio on who you are just a little bit <laughs> Well, um, my first consciousness of what, um, of the inequalities that existed in the United States came when I was in high school. It did not come when I was a child. Um, I was born in Aurora, Illinois, and um, from a working, in a working class family. And, um, 
you know, like so many places at that time, we were segregated. Then by class and by race, and there were African Americans who lived in the town, but along on the other side of the railroad tracks, on the railroad tracks lived poor whites from the South. We lived on the east side where most working class whites lived. On the west side of the city lived all the owners and managers. So I had more of a class consciousness than I did race class consciousness. I didn't even know that African American people lit existed until I was in high school. And, um, and then I was still very ignorant, thought that African Americans didn't really give it that much thought, but that everybody who came to the United States came here voluntarily and was escaping some kind of economic hardship in the countries that they came from. I knew nothing of slavery. And that's one of the reasons it's important for us to know these, the stories of struggles in this country too, because the more we know, the more we can act correctly and, and properly is with a sense of justice. From there, I um, became involved in a movement called Young Christian Students, which Teresa also was involved in, and on our council, Teresa on our council. And um, that was an international movement that began during World War II to fight fascism and um, justice all over the world. In, I worked in a factory after college. I went to, then I went to college, Alverno College in Milwaukee, which has always been a working class women's college that, um, uh, and there I became involved in the civil rights movement and participated in national organization, National Student Association, civil rights movement nationally, and so on. After that, I began working in Chicago with um, labor union and followed that with my work in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago. I've always been involved in the church, um, first the Roman Catholic Church, and then I left that and uh, United Methodists have had a strong Christian underpinning to everything that I've done. When the various leaders in the in Lincoln Park community were murdered or jailed or went underground in the early 70s. Um, I didn't know where I was going. I went to the South Side because I had some connections there in the Methodist Church and um, to, to Inglewood, where, which is where I have been basically ever since um, uh, working in community development and ran an arts and cultural center for 23 years. Started and, and it was a way to bring together, to generate the creative input of the community. I've been involved in many other movements along the way and here I am today, 80 years old and Happy to be here. Pat, you're very modest, but can you share with some of the people that you worked with who inspired you? Well, um, as I said, uh, you know, I knew Jack Egan. Um, and he and my husband were friends. My husband was, there were, three people in, in the church movements in the city that worked as brothers together. Jack Egan, my husband, Jim Reed, and um, uh, Rabbi um, Marx uh, from the um, Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And they worked together on many things. Um, uh, of course, in the arts movement, I worked with uh, Margaret Burroughs and um, 
many others in the arts community, African-American arts community, since that's where the center was principally based. My mind just went blank, John, I'm sorry. I was thinking about who inspired you in the 60s when you were in, you know, when you were in Lincoln Park and organizing and who were some of the meet the, the key stakeholders that you were engaged with? Well, I mean, of course it was, we, we were in continual communication with the civil rights movement with King and, and um, my husband and King were in, in Boston University at the same time just to give a sense of, and um, and of course, toward the end of this, as I said, we the, we formed the Rainbow Coalition, which was um, included um, Fred Hampton, the Young Lords, um, Young Patriots Organization, which we actually which actually grew out of concerned citizens of Lincoln Park. All the, all, as I said, there were 26 churches involved in the initial movement. I'm still in touch with um, a number of those individuals. And um, of course we were involved in the education, uh, uh, school desegregation, uh, movement, many of the movements that were taking place uh, citywide, but the principal movement that, that we had going in Lincoln Park was around housing. Could you talk a little bit about your relationship with the Young Lords? Well, I first met the Young Lords. Um, we were preparing for a, a meeting um, it was a, really the first meeting in which the plans for the city of Chicago for the eastern part of the community were going to pre be presented. And the first on the agenda was a row of houses in the 2000 block of Halstead, which was scheduled for um, uh, eviction of tenants and um, renovation, in some cases dem demolition. So we had organized the residents to make signs and to go to the meeting. We were, we were on the sidewalk making um, protest um, signs and there was, a, there was a hot dog stand on the corner, <laughs> Halstead and Dickens. And um, there were a bunch of guys hanging at the hot dog stand. That was their main hangout. And, one of them came over to me and said, what are you doing? So I explained what was happening with urban renewal and um, why we were there making signs and invited them to make signs. And he said, you white bee, you just think <laughs> you can run everything here. Uh, it was Cha Cha Jimenez and it was, ch it was not a political organization. But they did come, they brought about 15 guys to the meeting, uh, which was one or two nights later, and walked in, looked at the plans for the city, saw that every place where they and their families lived was gone from the, from the plans. And it was to be a wealthy, wealthy housing uh, right in the area of what now is Lincoln Park High School. It was Waller High School at the time. And um, they proceeded to walk into the meeting, tell the city leadership that, um, that asked where the, uh, their homes were and were told that, well, we've made other arrangements. And they said, well, until we are included at that table with you and, um, and there are plans for the Puerto Rican community. This will get, not go forward. And they proceeded to break up the entire space, both windows, pipes, everything. <laughs> and the nice religious people that were standing there just looked. <laughs> Nobody objected. They just looked in awe at the whole different method of protest that had been going on up to that point. Um, 
So from that point on, many, many nights of political education and um, many events and, and demonstrations and making um, uh, um, various things for, for protest marches involving music and all these things that the young lords developed into a political organization, which under the uh, direction of Chacha Jimenez, who really is a very charismatic individual and um, brilliant as well, sees the connection between what was happening in the community and the devastation in Puerto Rico by the US government. And so it became a re revolutionary organization in a very short period of time, just as the Panthers had been or had become. And they very quickly formed an alliance with the Panthers and uh, the rest is history up till today. There's still a close relationship with between all of them. What was your relationship with? Let me just say that the, the uh, batter, battle in Lincoln Park was so severe and so many people participating. We at our at our monthly meetings, we grew to the point of having a thousand people at a meeting. Um, because so many people were being um, um, threatened, threatened with their livelihood. Um, in addition, um, in the there were a number of leaders, as I said, that were murdered by the city. And each time the the um, memorial marches increased in number from first three thousand to up to ten thousand, one of the murders was a, um, a Methodist pastor and his wife um, uh, that pastored Armitage Avenue Methodist Church at the corner of of um, just west of Boston. Now we can't think on, on Armitage. Um, they had agreed that the young lords could use um, the lower level of the church for um, their cultural and, and political operations. And, um, and also the Lord started participating in services with them on Sunday. But um, a short time, and this was a short time after the takeover of McCormick Theological Seminary, the Lords, um, or a short time after the young Lords started using the church facility, the um, pastor Bruce and, and his wife Eugenia Johnson were murdered by, there's never been an investigation by the city of Chicago. Wow. Um, they were murdered, they were found, their children, they had three, um, toddler children, a three-year-old and uh, twins who were two years old. Uh, they were found wandering on the street in the morning, um, crying and bloody. The mailman found them. And um, that memorial, memorial and march following, you can believe, attracted 10,000 people. Hmm. We just we just had the final recognition la a year ago by the Methodist Church of the death of Bruce and Eugenia, and um, it was a gathering of many who had been, had been involved at that time. Hmm. Let me just say that to the Paul's credit. I'm not even sure that the leadership of DePaul knows, but the one of the major archives of this whole period is housed in DePaul Library. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in the DePaul research section of the library. And there are other areas. McCormick Seminary has um, a re research section in their library and there are several other places including my personal. Um, to, if I may add to that, Pat, um, the 
there is also, you know, um, I, I think for for faculty at the Paul, you know, to to be able to to be able to to see you know the archives and explore the archives is very important not everybody though uses the archive uh, but some of us do and it is important for us that our students know this history and and the students ask questions right i had a student um very um uh she, she was really uh upset right uh, very upset because she didn't know the story. And she says, I wish that I would have known this in my freshman year uh, during um, one of the first courses that I take. Uh, and it is important for other students to know this from the get go. So she wrote to the president <laughs> asking, you know, if, if that would be something uh, that they would consider. And I think that, um, you know, students not all, but some of the students uh, start to ask questions and to start, you know, also um, visiting the archives. Um, and I think that that is important in, in that sense, right? To, to build that awareness and to invite the students and um, friends to, to come and visit the archive and do their own research, um, visit the places uh, where all these events happen uh, one of the things that um, some professors do is um, we ask the library to take us on a tour around Lincoln Park to see, you know, what was then, how did it happen, when these meetings were held. Uh, so students know that history. And I think that it's so important that they know it from the very beginning. That's one of the things I have found in my life that so many mistakes are made by all of us when history is kept from us. I mean, as I said, as a child, I didn't know about the history of slavery. And when I did find out, I still thought that people came here willingly as um, immigrants rather than as slaves. And it wasn't until later. Well, in, in, in high school, I, through trips into the city through this group called Young Christian Students, we met many people who told us the real story. And um, when we don't know our history, history, we, may, we not only, people might, do very terrible things thinking they're acting correctly. Um, it's not just make mistakes, but those mistakes can have severe consequences if we don't know our history. So yes, I agree with you totally that we have to know the history. Um, but there are things that can be done now. Um, Kevin, yes, the, um, as I said, there are, there are many facilities that could even be used now and all the um, environmental problems cleaned up and reused and created into amazing facilities for housing for people who uh, may need housing. There are wide sections of land that can be developed. If the university were to take a position, we're not building any new buildings for the university and for the next five years, we will use all of our resources, available resources to create new housing for people in the city of Chicago or beyond. Lead a national movement among the university. Why not? Why wouldn't they want to become a leader, taking the lead among Catholic universities first and others uh, later on? The three universities in Chicago that um, have been at the were at the heart of this during the 60s. Um, DePaul can make a name for themselves in a different way. Um, they've created, you know, uh, 90,000 um, amazing um, alumni who are serving the world. 
those alumni, I'm sure, would want them to redirect their energies to serve um, the people who are in particular need in the city of Chicago and beyond. Pat, Pat I think um, Lena wants to share. She had her hand up, so. Yeah, I just want, I came to Chicago. Thank you, Pat. It's really interesting because I came to Chicago in 75 and I don't think I was aware of as much, but I did work at Jane Addams Center Hull House and we were also experienced huge gentrification at that time and displacement of families that we actually offered programs for and were part of our community. So, um, but I'm just trying to figure out did, did uh, Mayor Daly and the city also like then at the same time create all the public housing? You know what I mean? Like what's the parallel time? Because it seemed to me that like a Caprini Green or a Robert Taylor Homes and all these other things, I think they came after the war, but I don't know when particularly and was this in concert with the universities because Hull House obviously got displaced with Florence Scala and the West Side with the building of UIC. Hull House was 13 city buildings and 13 buildings on several many blocks of the West Side where Hull House Museum is now in the original Hull House. But um, so Jane Addams Center, which is at Bel was at Belmont and Broadway, was one of the buildings they bought when they got bought out, when they were told to move from UIC's building. Um, but it seemed to me that the public housing must have been an incentive too, in some ways, or some, when, does anybody know when public housing was built? Yeah, the Public housing predated. The, predated uh, all this. Yeah. Um, okay. Cabrini was, the the movement for public housing was late 50s, early 60s. And um, in fact, I know so many people who were raised in one or another of the various uh, public housing units. And, you know, they were raised in the six, 50s. Um, so it was uh, part of the movement right after World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But newer immigrants that came in the um, mid to late 50s, like the Puerto Rican community, Chicago was the, the second only second place in the United States where the Puerto Rican community came um, after World War II, of course, New York City, and then, um, to the city of Chicago. And they were first in the area just north of the loop, and then they were moved from there and then kept being moved further. And so at the time that I started working in the Lincoln Park community, they had been there from the early 60s and did not want to be moved again. Right. Yeah, I think even with that, uh, one of our council members, uh, Jose Zayas, um, he came, you know, his family came from Puerto Rico to uh, Lathrop Homes. Yeah. Right, which was that um, right off of Damon and I guess what would that be? Uh, diversity. Diversity, yeah. Right, right. It's now been totally transformed. And right, yeah. And then actually what the irony is, is that uh, Jose has been on the front line of organizing, you know, um, with LC, uh, LSNA, yeah. uh, John McCormick Jr. Yeah. Bob. Hi. Um, I don't know. Bob had his hand up, Kevin. But he didn't okay, sorry. <laughs> we read a lot about the empty buildings now that are not going to be filled up again as people have moved home and other places during you know, the pandemic. And the, there are different theories and ideas about how all of this empty space can be converted, you know, into decent housing. Do you, do you have any theories about that? Any opinions about that? Um, I think whatever is possible. Okay. <laughs> we need to consider. The, the, we know that many people have been displaced or will be displaced as a result of COVID. I mean, when with no income, no ability to pay uh, rents, uh, 
both the tenants and the owners have been in jeopardy. Um, um, owners have who own two or three flats, maybe even a little bit larger. Many haven't been able to pay make mortgage payments. So um, on both ends, tenants and owners may be losing property. We're going to have even more empty buildings and more people in need. So a a comprehensive use of all that, I think, is necessary. Why not? <laughs> Kevin, I got one more question, one last question for, for Pat. Uh, Pat, you were uh, a member, I guess you could say, of, of the original Rainbow Coalition. Um, and you saw um, the recent movies and there's been, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, I, I guess it's, it's been revived in a way, you know, alive. It, it's a, a lot of that that's coming out now, is it accurate? The movie that came out, um, the the documentary, you know, uh, that came out with WTTW. How do you feel about it? Is it really capturing, you know, the the real experience, or is some of it more myth than? John, that? you know, I have not seen it. Every time I they were showing it, I wasn't available to see it. So, um, no, I have not seen it. However, um. Um, uh, some people, including Cha Cha, felt that it was a that he always gets angry about certain <laughs> things in in um, videos or movies. He doesn't feel that they're accurate, but he felt that overall it it had a good portrayal. And I have to say that uh, Fred Hampton Jr. did review it before it came out. Although he was young, he was in, he was still in his mom's belly at the time that um, you know everything happened. But um, he felt it was a, a, and his mom Akua felt it was a fairly accurate portrayal. What was it like working with Chairman Fred? Oh my God! Talk about a brilliant, sensitive young man he died at age 21 i mean he was organizing in his high school and college when he was a teenager brilliant 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 but not just brilliant but so connected to the community and sensitive to the human needs of the community Um, there, there are, there are a couple of videos that I've seen in recent years in which, uh, you know, portrayed the actual, um, th that were selections from those days in which Fred was engaged in, in the uptown area with, um, the, young patriots organization that grew out of lincoln park but um in the uptown area and then it moved more north as people move and um you know fred was at the meeting and uh, along with uh, one of his principal organizers talking about the importance of uh poor people's coalition around singular issues that people organize, live in their own communities, retain their own history and culture, but come together to organize around common issues. And that really was the theme that we had stood for in Lincoln Park and that he stood very strongly for and was very articulate about. And, um, and that's how we all came together. So I don't know about the recent movie, but those videos, I have a selection of them, are um, very accurate portrayals of Fred. You also work with Sal Alinsky, right? Well, 
<laughs> yeah, not, not a lot. And I knew about Saul Alinsky, but we found that the, our style, I knew about the theories of Linsky organizing and I respected them, but for us, it was a whole different strategy, kind of strategy that was necessary. Um, and in the later days, one of the things that happened when I moved south and began working in Inglewood and, and started working both sides of Garfield Boulevard, back of the yards in Inglewood, um, we were, a lot of people were in dialogue about the formulation of the art center, which later came into being. Um, the um, back of the yards neighborhood council, which was the baby of Solinsky, had become very reactionary and um, and participated with the city of Chicago in um, redlining and um, and and contract buying and so on, and so they would not allow a black family to uh, cross the boulevard and and buy in back of the yards at that time. And so I guess that could happen in any organization, but there are certain structural things I think we have to look at, which led to that kind of intransigence, I can't think of it, intransigence um, in uh, uh, back of the yards neighborhood council. You also work with King, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, um, more with, um, well, I mean, not really with King directly. I participated in the, um, what came to be a very um, uh, ugly kind of march from the, uh, the white community point uh, um, in, uh, what, 1967? No. What years? Now I'm confused about years. When King first came to Chicago, he had a march to Marquette Park, and the um, white community was very frightening, um, throwing bricks and stones, and I was embarrassed. I've been embarrassed many, many, many times over the years of being white, but since my base has always been <laughs> people of, mixed, including white or, or people of color, totally. So what can I say? I... Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Pat. I, I would love to hear if anyone else has any personal experience with this, but uh, before going into that, I think, um, does anyone know if um, any there's any examples of universities um, taking this lead and making uh, that's a good example? May I? Yeah. It's interesting that you said that. This is weird. This email came to me um, a day or two ago, um, and it is from, I'm going to send it, I'm going to put it in the chat, and then I'll send it to you, Kevin, to distribute if anybody's interested in checking this out. But it says that the Office of Community Engagement and Neighborhood Health partnerships with UIC Healthy City Collaborative. And it seems that they're going to do a community research console. They've had one meeting and I think they're reaching out to get more community engagement around housing and food insecurity. Um, it's going to be on June 8th from um, um, 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. And um, the Chicago Department of Public Health um, is involved. Um, Northwestern um, ARC, I guess they, they're gonna do a participatory research um, you know, piece of this. And, I th and University of Chicago, the UI Health is involved in some other um, organizations, my eyes, I can't even see their logos. But I'm I'm gonna go to check it out to see, you know, like what's this all about? You know, um, is it really, you know, they're really engaging community. And I think it'll be really interesting. Um, I've got a whole bunch of things. This is first Pat, thank you. And just thank you. I, you know, I I can't 
I don't think I can even thank you enough with the wealth of information and knowledge that you have just shared. It is, my mind is just racing from it. And you've really got me thinking. Um, yeah, so it, it would be interesting, you know, to, to hold, you know, these universities accountable. So if this is a potential venue, then, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to put that out there, you know, to just to see where, you know, are they really being real about community input, you know? Mm. Um, that was one thought. Another one um, that um, we were talking about, how do we get people to know? One, there was one community tool that really benefited me a lot when I was working in the South Chicago area. And I was actually trained, and it was by De, um, DePaul, on giving tours, community tours. And can you imagine if you were to give a tour just on DePaul itself and about, you know, gentrifying communities, you know, um, through universities, you know, that would be a really interesting tour to have that kind of conversation about, you know, and maybe it does expand out to other universities. I just find that, you know, you're right, we don't know, you know, like you talked about not knowing Black people. I was born, you know, into civil rights, so my village protected me from racism. So my encounter with white people was not until I think I was, I was going into my teens because I was taking swimming lessons on 111th in Roseland and Roseland was all white. And I had never been in the community before, you know. And so that was kind of, but, you know, but my biggest um, was going to UIC and it was overwhelming, I have to say, you know, it was, it was, you know, just very diverse. And so that, that was hard for me to find my niche and people at that time. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to say there is a movie. I don't know whether you all have ever seen it. It's called Medium cool is oh, anyone, yeah. is anyone, oh my gosh it's like it's a must see it is a must see medium cool by haskell wexler right. and it is just you, you know you know please join in if you want to you know talk about it but there is this one scene that stands out to me where the he he takes this long shot and he's in Lincoln Park and you see the gentrification as it's happening. Mm. So you see the, the um, disheveled housing and then you see these young white couple coming in as they're moving in their furniture, but, but you could tell that they you know, like they were upper class and it was just really demonstrating the change of the community. And this was shot in the summer of 1968. Oh, wow. and, and it was just, it was amazing. And I mean, this movie is for Chicago. It's important in so many different levels because he, you know, he added fiction, you know, with reality. So he actually ends up into the Democratic convention when the riots break out and wow. he keeps and he keeps shooting. And it's just, it's just amazing and, and mind boggling. And then for the, you know, and for me, because I was in theater at the time, you know, my, I think the mother of black theater of Chicago, Val Gray Ward, as mm -hmm. a young woman was in this film and so the actors of that time, there was a scene where they were in there and they were organizers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and some uh, media person is trying to interview them and they're not trusting. It was a wonderful scene for me to see in my youth, to see, to see her in her youth, in her heyday on this, captured on this film, 
that is now critically acclaimed. So I medium cool, check it out, check it out. You know, so I'm I'm gonna <laughs> shut up now. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Stop. Thank thank you for letting me share. Oh, that's awesome. I, I just want to say one, one thing in the Hyde Park neighborhood, Hyde Park sort of set the standard for how all these things were going to develop. They were in number one. But they were, when, when the process of emptying buildings began in the uh, Woodland, Hyde Park Woodlawn neighborhood, the um, a real estate company, I don't know the name of it, hired the Blackstone Rangers to burn down buildings. And it was reported in the Chicago newspapers that 301 children had been burned to death. Mm. And mm. now, of course, the Blackstone Rangers were victims of segregation and pro poverty and a horrible life. So they were using the own, their own community the, the real estate company was using the black community against the black community. And it was so tragic on all sides, but that was all part of that housing struggle in the uh, expansion of the university and the city. Just one other thing. I was in Hyde Park the other day on, in a new building that had gone up in two years it was uh, just east of Lake Park at 50, 60, wait a minute, um, 59th Street. And, uh, um, and as I looked to the west, there was the old Hyde Park Bank building and right next to it, an enormous, beautiful blue glass building that on the side said University of Chicago. Now this is a mile from the, at least a mile from the main university buildings and two miles from the medical center. So what university building it was, I don't know, but I asked the woman whose home I was at, um, what is that University of Chicago building? She said, well, I hadn't noticed it. You know, they own everything here. And this is brings me to the, Point I was going to start with today. In the early 1960s, I actually had a record of this in my hand at one point. Julian Levy, who was president of the board of the university, said if the University of Chicago is to become the most influential university, we must set our sights on acquiring all the property from uh, 22nd Street on the north to 63rd Street on the south from the lake to the proposed expressway. And they have actually accomplished that, in fact, gone further. Um, that's long range planning. We, as human justice fighters, have to have longer range planning. And, and, and this is why I believe that with the right plans and uh, in terms of vision and strategy, we can accomplish all things. We just haven't trusted our power, the power of the people enough. Yes, I, I, my name is not Desiree Jordan, it's Pamela Dominguez. Hello, John. <laughs> I was like, you look so familiar, I'm like, who is <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh my God. It's so good to see you. Thank you. And I just want to thank whomever said yes to allow me to come on it. And this again, uh, Pat and I are friends, John Ziegler for years, but I've, it's just opened up so much more to me. And I've always been interested in community organizing. I did community organize. It was a community organizer. Not on the level of Pat. I thought I was doing something, but Pat is the uh, organizer number one. But I really enjoyed this dialogue. It's, um, even at the age I'm retired, <clears throat> working part-time, uh, I worked for the University of Illinois and the University of Chicago in their asthma programs after I retired. So I, 
I see what the universities are attempting to do in the communities, but I'm always curious about the word community engagement. What does that really mean? Mm. Does it mean you're going to come in and just do a program and then go about your business? Does it mean you're going to come in and really engage the people and give them the skills and trainings that they need to carry forth? Because what I've seen up to this point, the only program I saw <laughs> that had they did a cooking program which gave skills to a lot of young women and older women. Mm. And I'm using that not to make fun of what they accomplished, but that saying, you can feed a man uh, with a fish for a day. I don't know, somebody help me out. But if you teach them a fish, they can feed them <laughs> skills. That's what I, And that's what I've seen missing with the university's engagement. They come in and they do programs and then they leave and then the community really is in worse shape than when they came in. But I really want to thank each of you for, uh, you know, embarking upon this um, topic. Because when you look around and you wonder what in the world happened, and I'm a native Chicagoan, uh, Pat, the year that you were trying to see about the, um, the, the march in Market Park, I just read about that this week. It was August 5th, which was my birthday, 1966, that they were over there, um, Father Flager had written an article for a magazine that I was reading. So I've been here all my life. Uh, some things I was aware of, some as, as a little girl, I didn't know what a white person was. And it wasn't until I was way older, I was looking back at my grammar school pictures, there were white children in my class, but they were just children. They were just classmates at that time. Although I lived in uh, Longdale and we lived on 19th and Albany. And if we crossed 22nd in Albany, we were in trouble by the Caucasians. They would chase us home, try to beat us up. So I've seen a lot of the um, changes that have happened in the city. The, I'm going to say on the surface changes because I feel within that nothing really has changed. We have people that have changed, but not enough. And I just applaud Pat and what she has done over the years and the different groups. And I believe the universities could uh, play a vital role and I'm going to say this, I will not work for, who did I work for? Oh, I worked for Southwest Women Working Together, which is a women's group. I worked there for seven years. I planned on retiring, but we closed up. But anyhow, there was a woman at the university that I worked, she worked close with our organization. And she had me come into the University of Chicago and talk to students. I did a couple of times. And what I felt inside of what I shared with them, the students were very energetic, enthusiastic. But the one thing I shared with them, I said, please, I know some of you are only participating in this particular program because of the university. But when you leave here, don't throw all this stuff away. If your community doesn't need assistance, go in a community that you can take your skills and help them. Because uh, the young lady said about the student having it the first year of college, you can start um, uh, thinking about that and let it marinate in you. And is this beyond just the classroom? And there's, we need everyone to pitch in, give their talents, give their time to really help make this city and all over the United States and the world, make it a better place to be in. So again, I just want to say thank you. Pat was an excellent job. Excellent questions, John. So good to see your face. And uh, young man, Kevin, take this message with you. <laughs> thank you. Can I just say this? This is the fiercest... Desiree, uh, by the name of Pamela Dominguez. You want to talk about organizing. This sister right here is the most fierce organizer. She even put me on the rack a couple of times. So I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's so good to see you, Queen. It's really good to see you. I will say, on a, again, I don't know still with Pat, but I worked with the tennis um, mm. Tennis Rights Organization, and we we did a lot of uh, organizing around housing, and we would go into the suburbs and and organize out there, and that was interesting to me uh, because we were not well received at all in the Caucasian communities. But that was one of uh, a learning experiences for me. Uh, I went at first with a little trepidation, but when you get out, and I worked with an organization, uh, the Action Coalition of Inglewood which is still in existence, but not nowhere on the level that they were when I was involved. We went to Washington and we um, 
uh, stormed for our, our buildings. Uh, and uh, but again, I didn't do any with Martin Luther King. I was I, I, I was newly married. I was a young bride, and I look back and I said, "What was I doing during that time?" I was aware, but I wasn't involved. But uh, I have been on the fringes of a lot. I'm just going to thank you again, Pat, but I'm wondering, you asked about what other universities are doing, and a number of universities nationally have like started to reckon with their history of slavery and their treatment or their lack of acceptance of Black Americans. And I'm wondering how they're capturing their history and dealing with history for students and for the larger community, because it may not be directly around housing, but it's still around past history of how the university thrives or made its way towards being this mega presence in a city without acknowledging its past, you know, so, so. Thank you, Lena. I, uh, that, that is happening and um, Paul can, can learn from that um, and their leadership, but, you know, just as a, Again, a, a Christian institution um, redirecting the moral compass of what happened previously. Um, um, Kevin said, well, we can't change what happened. That is true. We can redirect. And DePaul certainly has the ability, and I think he has some ready partners in, in McCormick and UIC now I don't know about the University of Chicago of um, wanting to take on the housing situation by the horn, uh, you know, the bull by the horns and uh, whatever direction that goes in reclaiming empty spaces, um, uh, um, spaces where there is not currently anything built, um, making a, a strong statement about what the resource of they've gained their resources by taking the land of other people right. and let's uh, redirect that to um, uh, take what lands are remaining to provide quality and I say quality because we don't just want people to be dumped into a empty space somewhere um, uh, but they're smart they know, they know what to do. They know how to use resources, how to secure additional resources. Um, the president just is uh, saying that he's going to call for additional monies. And people are questioning where, but additional monies for the housing situation that's bound to be really tragic this winter. Mm. Um, so, Anything we can do to push the university to that consciousness, let's do. I think, um, Mon I don't know if you got to see Monica's comment, Pat. Um, what are say, some of your recommendations for us at DePaul? Um, I know you're saying anything that we could do. Um, maybe someone is, maybe you could answer probably Monica too, but I'm also curious of um, what can I do though? Um, you know, other than just, sharing this knowledge as an individual you know i always feel like as an individual i feel um like you said i think we don't recognize the power and that hits me a lot for sure we could do something collectively as the council of elders if nothing more a well thought letter calling them to account in this time of reckoning Okay. One of the things, Pat, that I'm, uh, and, you know, we've talked over the years and, and you constantly feed me with new information. When I think I know you, I'm like, damn, I didn't know that, <laughs> right? Um, the importance of, of, of not making history just history, not make it archaic, where history is alive and it fuels um, change, right? Because, you know, I could argue that at DePaul, there's all kinds of people 
you know, depending on the department or whatever, they talk about the gentrification. They talk about these things. They talk with some, they celebritize Chacha Jimenez. They celebritize the young lords. And the black, but there is not any action, right? And I would include the Egan in that space of, to a certain extent, right? You know, um, and so how does history become actionable, right? And, and I think that that's the piece that I'm left with because, you know, you know we talked about the movie, even the, the movie is sort of a romantic space to, to look at the Black Panther Party, the young lords and, and this and that. But how does it become actionable? And, and I think that's the place that I'm in, you know, um, and not to keep talking about it in the context of this is, this is history, you know. Um, and so I, you know, so I'm left with that. And then I really um, give so much props to, to you who kept that in front of you and Lena and, and Jackie, you know, who, who kept these, kept it in front. <laughs> it's not behind, right? It's not something that we look back, but you kept that in. And Miss Desiree, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> Pamela, alias Pamela, um, you kept that in front of you, not behind you, right? And I think that that is so important, you know, and not to leave history as something that's archaic, that's you know, a dusty shelf, you know, and something that is something that is very actionable because it's present now, it's one full circle. Well, John, I have to say, for me, it's unfinished business and I feel responsible. Um, I left not knowing what to do. The book just came out, um, Apostles of Change, on the Latino community and their coming to political consciousness and revolutionary consciousness and action in the 60s and 70s and beyond. And um, one of the things that was said in that book, and it's, it was almost an, it was presented to me as an accusation but I, it's something that I have felt, and that is that um, after it appeared that you know leadership had was gone through the city killings and so forth, and and many other forms, and we had lost a major battle, that the movement seemed to dissipate, to dissolve. Partly, it, there was no movement left because young people were back on drugs and, and many things had happened. But it was new for all of us. We had no historical um, reference to go on. We didn't know what to do, how to do it um, when something was at its bottom point. But now I have much experience behind me and I know that we can go forward. I know that um, uh, we can continue to make change on a daily basis because of things happening to my body. I am not able to take up the banner as I used to, but there are things that can be done and other people who can be engaged to do them as well. And I really think as the Council of Elders, we can take action. I will, I will put together starting a letter to university, who, at the, who is the, the main, the principal, um, who are the principal decision makers at the university? The board of trustees. Okay, and who, who, you know, who are those individuals? You tell, the, address it to all of them. And, and to and send copies to the various departments or um, schools at the university. Um, there are ways that this can be done. And trust, trusting in uh, the, the you know, moral character of the university. Sounds great, Pat. Then let's. Um, and in the, in the history of Jack Egan, in the history and life reputation of Jack Egan for justice. I think, Pat, that, um, you know, really bringing this 
history that is so present, um, you know, when our students come into the poll in orientation days, um, maybe their Chicago quarter class, you know, finding a space there uh, that they they learn more about Jack Egan, they learn more about you know, um, what happened um, with the with gentrification and the role of the poll. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it is it is so important and so relevant, you know, as part of this. Um, you know, Vincentian values that the university um, starts in having conversations with the students. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, I think it is very important to do that, right? If you're talking about Vincentian values and asking the question, what must be done? Well, what I think what must be done is to, from the get-go, um, sharing these stories with students, sharing the history with the with the students that we are welcoming into, into this institution. Um, and, and, you know, very, very important is the, the role and the, the really um, very special work, uh, relevant work of Father Egan. Um, it, it could also be, uh, shared during orientation for staff and mm -hmm. faculty. I didn't have that. I didn't know when I came to the pod, I didn't know about um, uh, the wonderful contributions of Father Egan. Uh, I learned about Father Egan when I came to the Egan Center, but not before. I wasn't aware uh, as a new um, staff member um, at the Paul, and also, you know, I I started working with the uh, um, uh, resource centers in the Latinx Cultural Center. That is also another space where these stories need to be told um, because they are um, they are so important to to our students of color, right? That these spaces are important to our students of color. Um, this needs to be widespread. Um, at the university, these stories, this, um, um, you know, all of all of this that you're talking about, that is so important that the students know across the board. Mm -hmm. But as I say, the, you know, the triumvirate of, of uh, Jack Egan, Jim Reed, and, and uh, Rabbi Marx, um, they were always supporting what each was doing in their various spheres. And, you know, it was a kind of relationship that we need more of nowadays, that we can't all be everywhere, but we need to consciously be supporting each other. And I believe that, I feel that that is, also happens on the uh, Elders Council. And Rabbi Marx just passed, what about a month ago? He just died, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Both of them, I have the sermons that both of them preached at my husband's. Wow. You have such great history. Uh, I gotta, I gotta definitely hear more about, about all this. Well, um, we're getting really close to the two. Uh, before um, we close out, I want to see if anyone just wanted to say any other comment um if not it's fine but just don't just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to share anything if they like i'll go um i'm maury richie and i'm here because dr samuel um shared information about this meeting so i'm so grateful to be here and um uh Patricia, thank you so much. Wealth, 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 wealth of information that you shared. I don't know if you've written a book. If you have, I'd like to. <laughs> or if you haven't written a book, I think you should. Um, that's just my two cents. Um, one of my questions is, and I think it was brought up earlier, action. A lot of times we, it, it just seems like when I think through the past, by the time communities find out about gentrification and other things, it's too late. 
And one of the things that, you know, as I, as I'm going through studies now um, at NLU in the Master of Public Administration program, it's like, how can we get the community engaged? Because it seems like by the time the community gets engaged, it's too late. Um, so that's a question that's always looming around in my head. And I'm just putting that out there. Thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a dissertation question right there. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But I could say as we strive to do that at the Egan, I mean, we have to really think about what do we mean by community, number one, right? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I think we simplify language to, to when we say community, there's community is so many different things and it means so much to different people, right? And um and so I think we, we start there, you know, how do, whatever population or whatever segment of the community, how do they, how do they claim community? How do they define community? I, you know, I, I think that's important. How does community define their community, <laughs> right? Not for us to define it. And I think from, from our perspective, that's where we, we, we start and struggle with. Um, so no, I, I clearly hear you. Is anyone just final, any final words? Um, yeah, I, I, would, I just wanted to say thank you for, for everything today. This has been really interesting. I'm not from Chicago originally, so it's always really interesting to hear more about the history that I think is kind of ignored by a lot of people or isn't really addressed by a lot of people. And I've, I've kind of been sitting here and making a list of names and topics to research over the summer. So I just really, really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to listen in today and to learn from other people's experiences.